we, uh, we definitely had a great week. Hey, well, first of all, I want to encourage you to ask questions. We do our best to, uh, on, on the lives here, to answer the questions as they come in live, <clears throat> at least if you have a good question. And uh, sometimes we get so many questions, you can't answer them all. Uh, I want to remind you that today is election, presidential election day, and go vote. And I pointed out Sunday, like, I don't, listen, I'm not loyal to a political party. I'm loyal to the King of Kings. So I don't blow, I don't <laughs> bloat. I don't vote. I don't vote my party. I vote my conscience. So please do that. Please ask Holy Spirit who to vote for on these different, uh, different people, different issues. And then... It's March is Women's History Month, and we got the Fashion to Rain book right here, Empowering Women to Fulfill Their Divine Destiny. A little plug for the book in, uh, in, in Women's March, Women's History Month. So uh, love that. Get that book. You'll like it. So today we're talking about empowering women. We're actually talking about Fashion to Rain. And we have some um, questions here. Why'd you write Fashion to Rain? Well, let me tell you, uh, I had this encounter with Danny Silk. And Danny Silk stepped into my office many years ago and he said, hey, I feel like we need to proactively empower women. And I'm like, what are we doing? It looks like we're empowering women, like half our staff are women. And we're moving women into leadership roles and women are teaching in our, in our, in our environment. And he's like, I feel like we need to do more. So I actually said, okay, well, let me think, what, what else can we do? And um, I, I left there and the Lord gave me this message about empowering women. So I, I was in Pennsylvania at, um, I think Charles, oh, I can't remember his last name, Charles's church. And, and I was preaching this one message that I got on empowering women after Danny talked to me about, we should do more. And when I finished the message, uh, a publisher came up to me and said, hey, this needs to be a book. You need to write a book about this. Oh gosh, I don't know if I have enough for a book, but okay. So I, uh, I started this, this, this uh, interacting with this publisher and anyway, they gave, me a, they gave me a contractual agreement to write a book. And I got about, oh gosh, I, I signed a contract for like 50,000 words, which is very common for a book. And I got about, about 35,000 words in and I had nothing else to say and I'm like, oh gosh, how am I gonna finish this book? And uh, I, I just started like, okay, well, let's tell some more stories. And then I had like three months left to, uh, to finish this book and I was out of things to say and the president of the company of, Bake, uh, of Baker uh, Chosen, Chosen Books, is uh, Mr. Baker, uh, he sent me a message and said, hey, I feel like this book is supposed to be a foundation for the charismatic movement for empowering women. Um, we'd love for you to write a 75,000 word book. Um, oh gosh. Anyway, short story, I agreed to that. He gave me like another six months. I spent 100, 600 hours researching all the scriptures around women, the ones that were restricted women, and uh, probably the most work I've ever put in a book, and that's how we got fashion to reign. So, uh, I, I, um, I wrote this book to really, um, you know, agree with what Danny said. We need to be more proactive about empowering women. So what's God's true plan for uh, the purpose of women? Well, let me say, you know, we always like to go back to the beginning of anything. Like, what did God first say about any particular subject? And on women, in Genesis 1, he created Adam and Eve. He, he empowered both of them. He, he created uh, man, both uh, male and female. And he, uh, and he, you know, he commissioned them. He said, you know, uh, he said, be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. And I, I'd like to point out that he didn't say to Adam, you, you subdue the earth, Eve, you kind of help him out. He actually commissioned them both. So in the beginning, the, the divine plan of the creator was that women and men would stand together in the powerful authority and have powerful authority over um, the earth. And then when Adam and Eve fell, you know, the curse over the woman was that your husband will rule over you. You will have pain in childbirth and your husband will rule over you. I'd like to point out that what God didn't say is all men will rule all women. In the Hebrew language, there is a separate word for wife 
and woman and a separate word for man and husband. Now, the reason I bring that up is because when you get to the New Testament, which is written in Greek, there is one word that describes woman and wife, one word, and one word that describes man and husband. So you have to kind of decide what, you know, is he speaking about husbands or is he speaking about men? But in the Old Testament, there's two words. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that even under the curse, God did not put all men over all women. He put husbands over wives under the curse. But thank God that Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, he became a curse for us to release us from the curse of the law. And no longer are we living under the curse. And that would include man, it would include woman, and it would include actually creation. So we're no longer under the curse. I believe that God has created man and woman equally powerful but distinctly different. Let me say this, equally powerful but distinctly different. When God took Adam and he put him to sleep, he took the woman out of the man. He took the woman out of the man. So we have these kind of statements we say in culture like, you need to get in touch with your feminine side if you're a man. And it's like, you don't actually have a feminine side. The only way you get in touch with your feminine side is to actually get married because your, your wife is carrying the other side of the nature of God. And let me say this, God made Adam both male and female and men and women are not the same. They're equally powerful, but distinctly different, which means that God took his nature and he broke it into two, two different genders, male and female. And so if you oppress women, you lose the revelation of half the nature of God because God is not just a man. He didn't create man in his image and women in some other image. He created a male and female he created man in his image. He created woman in his image. And they are not the same. So therefore, the two become one. And that one gives us the revelation of the nature of God. So uh, for all of you out there, like you, maybe you have a lower value of women. What, to the level that you value women, you, you value the, the, the female, if I could say, the female side of God, the, the part of God that, that is like a woman. Um, wow, we got questions coming in right now. Bunch of questions. Um, <clears throat> there are, I, I think we're going to be working on this teaching for the next month. So we'll talk about the hard passages in, uh, that Paul wrote to uh, Timothy and to Titus um, and to Corinthians. We'll talk through those, uh, like why are they actually there? And it, did God mean for women to not be able to teach? Did he mean for them to not exercise any authority? Did he mean that they couldn't be elders in a church? And I, I'd love to talk through those, and maybe we'll just do a session on the four verses that out of uh, 40 authors, there's uh, one author, Paul, the Apostle Paul, that seems to restrict women. I will give you a little hint of where we're going on that. Paul wrote to nine regions. He wrote to Jews, he wrote to Romans, and he wrote to Greeks. And uh, out of those nine regions, he, in, in only three regions did he ever talk about the restriction of women, and that was in Greek cities. And it, you, you may know this, but the Jews oppressed women. And as a matter of fact, a woman could not be a witness in a court case because she was thought of as being inherently evil. She couldn't own property. She couldn't, she, she was, it was illegal to teach the woman the Torah, the Bible. This, was, this is in Jewish culture. In Roman culture, women could own property. They could be a witness in a court case. Um, they actually had, they could actually vote, um, but they were definitely, um, they definitely were not equal to men. But in Greek culture, the Greeks, they, they had this, uh, this core value that because, for, that because women gave birth to every man and because women, because men had a greater sex drive than women, they, their, their core value was that because the woman came first, she was actually in charge of the man. And secondly, because, uh, because women had less of a sex drive than men, they, they, they denoted out of that that a woman had something a man wanted, but a man did not have something a woman wanted. So the Greeks actually made, they actually, they actually served women. And the three cities that Paul wrote to, you know, Greeks had many gods, of course, you know that. Greek mythology had many gods. They had man gods and women gods, they had male gods and female deities. <clears throat> Interesting thing, 
<clears throat> about Paul's letters. He writes to the Corinthians, he writes to the Ephesians, and he, uh, and he writes to, to, uh, to Titus at Crete, three cities. Out of the nine cities he wrote to, <clears throat> he writes to three of them are Greek cities. And not only are they Greek cities, but they're Greek cities with the deity, the head deity in Corinth, in Creed, and in Ephesus are all women. They're all women. And so <clears throat> when, when women got saved in Greek culture, they thought that they should still exercise authority over all men. This is the way Greek mythology worked. And in those cities where the Greek, where the, the Greek god was actually a goddess, like they had Greek male and female gods in each one of those cities. But the senior or the, the most prominent god in Ephesus, the most prominent god in Creed, and the most pr prominent god in Corinth were all uh, female deities. And so, um, you, well, and out of that we can, we can talk through why Paul uh, actually talked through restrictions in those areas. But <clears throat> does it make sense to you that in the Old Testament a woman could be the judge of a whole nation? Does it make sense to you that a woman could be a queen in a whole nation? Does it make sense to you that a woman could be a prophet to a nation? But in the New Testament, she can't be an elder. She can't, she can't speak in church. She can't talk in church. So are we saying, that the overview of this, is we, are we saying that the old covenant was more women-friendly than the new covenant in which Jesus set women and men free from the curse? Are we actually saying that women could rule a nation, but they actually can't lead a church? Um, I, I'd love to have that conversation, and we'll talk more about that. Um, can women, I'd love to share, uh, uh, a person asked this question, can you share your thoughts on women in preaching and ministry and also in the roles of leadership? Yes, I believe that women can carry any role a man can carry. There are women, you know, uh, Paul said in Ephesians 4 there, that he gave some of his apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of service. Paul was very aware when he said prophets, for example, that there were prophets and prophetesses, that there were male and female prophets. And he put them to, and he says that prophets equip the saints to do the work of service. If Paul was trying to restrict women from having governmental positions, he would have made a statement that only men can be apostles, only women can be prof, uh, men can be apostles, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. By the way, the very first evangelist in the entire New Testament was Mary. <laughs> Uh, the angel said to Mary at the tomb, go tell the disciples and Peter, I rose from the dead. She shared the good news and the entire, and, and the disciples, she actually was there at the, you know, at the resurrection when the, you know, the 11, 11 disciples that were left, Jesus said, I'll, I'm going to rise on the third day. And none of those male apostles showed up at the tomb on the third day. But Mary was there, and Mary had to go tell the disciples that I have risen from the dead. I'd also point out that the woman at the well was another great evangelist. So she went out and told her whole city everything that Jesus had told her. If she was restricted from preaching the gospel, think about, think about that, that Samaria would have not come out to see Jesus. So it goes on and on and on. In the New Testament, we have a, uh, we have a, a named female apostle, we have, uh, we have named uh, teachers, uh, women teachers in the Bible. Uh, we have Priscilla and Aquila who both taught Apollos the, uh, a better, the, a more accurate teaching that was included Apollos uh, and Priscilla. Pr I'm sorry, uh, Aquila, what am I trying to say? Aquila and Priscilla. So uh, yes, we have women teaching in the Bible. We have women shepherding in the Bible. We have women apostles in the Bible. We have women prophets in the Bible. So yes, can they, can they, can they uh, teach and preach? Absolutely they can. Remember I said they're equally powerful, but they are distinctly different. So women are doing what men can do, but they're going to do it differently because their strengths and weaknesses are complementary. Um, Cheryl asks, what is the what, in what capacity is best for a woman to minister to men, to lead over men as men's ministry or like. Uh, I, men need to hear from the mothers and fathers. They don't just need to hear the fatherly counsel. They don't just need to hear, you know, uh, male uh, <clears throat> insights. 
They need fathers and mothers to minister them. Think about Proverbs 31, or let's think about the book of Proverbs. You know, um, <clears throat> I've got a, a frog in my throat. Um, Proverbs is the <clears throat> was the homeschool textbook of um, of Solomon. Solomon said, "These are the things my mother's taught. My mother taught me. These are the things my father instructed me in." So, <clears throat> take Proverbs thirty one. Proverbs thirty one was actually what Solomon's mom taught him about women and how women should behave. So. Solomon learned from his mother and he learned from his father. Which one of us want to be instructed only by a male? I mean, not me. I definitely, I, I definitely want a balanced approach. I want the nature of God that flows through women and the nature of God that flows through men to be instructing in my life. And to think that men don't need to hear from women is ridiculous. To think that men, uh, that women don't have a different perspective on life is, you know, a, some, uh, let me say this. Women often have a different perspective on life. That's why we need them to teach us. That's why we need them to share with us the, uh, the nature of God that's flowing through them. <clears throat> Someone asked, uh, what are your thoughts on the Holy Spirit being female? I, I don't have an opinion about that. I think that God is both male and female. <clears throat> um, Rachel asked this, is empowering women in the kingdom culture the same as what the world associates with feminism. If not, what's the main difference? Feminism was, is, a, is a perversion of empowering women. It's the wrong version. Listen, male, this is the way feminism came about. Women couldn't vote till you know, uh, 1920 in our country, in America. Uh, women were thought of as second-class citizens. And so definitely our culture, our American culture, definitely lessened women. They, I would say, oppressed women. And so what happened in feminism is women were fighting for their own rights. And who had the rights? Well, men did. Men had authority. Women didn't. So men said, listen, if you want the same authorities we have, then you have to play the same role we play. And unfortunately, that, that spoke to women of, well, we, you have to have a 40-hour week job, we don't have a value for motherhood, so you got to, you got to, you know, put your kid with the babysitter. By the way, you know, I, I'm not saying that kids shouldn't be babysat. I'm not saying that women shouldn't work, if, you know, uh, uh, have a career job. I'm not saying any of that. As a matter of fact, my wife Kathy, in nine businesses we owned, we were partners. We were 50/50 partners. We led the businesses together. She led one part of the business. I led another, and she also uh, was very involved with our children. So it can be done. I would say a third of my staff that are women, no, half of my staff are women, a third of those women are married with children and they still have a full-time calling and career here at Bethel. So I, I, I want you to know that I have very much don't feel like there is a stereotype that women should follow. But let me say this, that God has a very, uh, has a high value for mothers. Feminism said, it, it, the way that women got power in our culture is that they became masculine. And we also, we have the, all these tests that we give women to figure out, are they as good as leaders as men? Here's the challenge. Guess who wrote the test? Men. So we wrote tests. I mean, we, all, all of our criteria, criteria, most of our criteria, let me, let me start over. Most of our criteria for choosing and training leaders is all male based. And so we teach women how to lead by the way we lead. We test women on their leadership capacity and capability based on masculine approach to leadership. And then we wonder why there's less leaders, less women leaders in our environment. Let me say this, if women wrote the tests around their strengths, and we took those leadership tests, and we took, when we embraced those leadership core values, we would be the ones sitting on the sideline. So I think it's really important to realize that a couple of things are happening. In empowering culture, when we empower women, we need men to teach women, we need women to teach men. But let me say this, that we need women to, that are great leaders 
to be teaching other women how to be great leaders because, again, women are equally powerful, but they are distinctly different. And so we're not going to have the strengths of their distinction, of their female distinction, if we only train women to lead like men. And so I've got a lot more to say about this. It looks like we ran out of time. Super excited to share more about it. And I'm sure there'll be lots of pushback. We have lots of people raised in religious cultures that do not empower women or that take you know, the three scriptures that seem to reduce women and say, well, here's the, here's the three verses that say women can't do anything in our culture. And by the way, so powerful are those verses and, and so misused uh, as they are, they've disempowered half the army of God. Half the army of God in, in the church has been disempowered because people misunderstand the culture and the background of those scriptures that Paul was dealing with. Well, I'm excited to tell you more. Um, hopefully, if you'd like to you know, get a, a, a really good insight into what I think about, uh, including those verses, um, uh, there's chapter after chapter on those, those restrictive verses, takes you through the Greek and the Hebrew, and actually what Paul was saying. It's in this book, Fashion Rain. You might want to get this. I think it's an, uh, it is an audio. I read this book myself on audio. I think you can get it in ebook. You can get it at uh, kvministries.com. Uh, you can also get it on um, the Bethel website, and you can get it on Amazon and any place great books are sold, as they say. Well, God bless you. I'll see you next week. Uh, I think we're doing a, an interview with Haley next week. So that ought to be a lot of fun on the subject of empowering women. See you next week.